Good afternoon. My name is Tim Doyle, and I'm a senior advisor here at the Bipartisan Policy Center. For those that have been following BPC over the last couple of years, you know that today's discussion is one of multiple that we've had on the topic of ESG, environmental, social, and governance issues. ESG has quickly become one of the most talked about topics on Wall Street and more recently here in Washington, DC. While the Security and, Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, and other financial regulatory agencies grapple with climate-related risk and other ESG issues, corporate disclosure has become central to that discussion. What exactly do companies have to disclose to the public? Trying to understand what needs to be disclosed brings us to the topic of today's discussion, which is materiality. What is the concept of materiality and why is it important? Today, we are incredibly fortunate to have two of the leading intellectual voices on ESG, the SEC, materiality, and a whole slew of topics related to the capital markets. First, I wanna introduce Professor Jill Fish. Professor Fish is the Saul A. Fox Distinguished Professor of Business Law at the University of Pennsylvania, having been appointed faculty at both the law school and the Wharton Business School. She's co-director of the Institute for Law and Economics, and has written more than 90 scholarly articles. Good afternoon, Professor Fish. Hi, pleasure to be here, thank you. Next, I wanna introduce Professor Amanda Rose. Uh, professor Rose is a professor of law at both Vanderbilt University's School of Law and their Owen Graduate School of Business. After graduating first in her class from the University of California, Berkeley, Professor Rose clerked on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. She has published num numerous law review articles and has presented the work around the world. Good afternoon, Professor Rose. Thank you for having me. It is worth noting uh, to the audience that both professors uh, independently uh, submitted comments to the SEC in response to a May 21st request for public input on climate-related and ESG disclosures. Thank you both for joining us today. Before we begin, I did wanna acknowledge those watching on YouTube, Facebook, or whatever name they come up with here in the next couple of days for that, or following us on Twitter. Uh, please submit your uh, questions online in the chat function or at hashtag BPC Live. Let's get started. So defining materiality. We want to start, probably makes sense to go back to the seminal case, 1976 Supreme Court case, TSC Industries. They set the standard in that opinion for determining materiality. In, in that, uh, uh, determining whether there was a substantial likelihood of the reasonable shareholder, this is the language of the court, uh, would consider the information important or material in making an investment decision. So this is the reasonable investor standard that so many people talk about. In that particular case, I think it was specifically dealing with voting. It's since been expanded to investment decisions. So I wanted to start with, I guess, Professor Rose, uh, what's the purpose uh, of disclosure under the SEC and how does it relate to materiality? Well, I would say that the purpose of mandatory disclosure, at least it's traditionally understood, is to ensure that um, financially motivated investors have access to the information that is important uh, to making informed uh, investment decisions, both trading decisions and voting decisions. And I think that the concept of materiality is related to that because it focuses the SEC's disclosure mandates on information that would be uh, important to reasonable investors, as you mentioned. And the concept of a reasonable investor has traditionally been understood uh, as an objective standard that focuses on um, what uh, uh, a financially motivated investor would deem to be important in making um, investment decisions. So it sort of tether tethers the SEC's disclosure um, uh, mandates to this underlying uh, purpose of, of disclosure. I'd also note that it, it's sort of a workhorse in the securities law. So, you know, in addition to sort of focusing uh, disclosure mandates, it also plays a role in um, fraud suits, only material misstatements and omissions are actionable. Regulation fair disclosure focuses on material information, insider trading prohibitions, uh, and, and a whole host of other things. So it's a very important concept in the law. But it was this 1976 case that really set the, the standards because it said the different various courts had had different kind of uh, uh, holdings with regard to what the materiality standard set. Um, well, uh, maybe I can just jump in there. Uh, I agree yeah, with so everything that Amanda said, even before I knew that she graduated first in her law school class. Now I'm doubly impressed. 
Um, but uh, yes, the Supreme Court uh, articulated this definition of materiality in uh, a voting case and then su subsequently adopted it for federal securities fraud, but it didn't purport to use that definition to define the contours of what companies have to disclose, right? It's a common misconception that we look to materiality and companies have to disclose information that's material and they don't have to disclose information that's not material. And that's not actually the case, right? The SEC has a pretty broad mandate. It can compel disclosure to protect investors and to protect the capital markets. Amanda talked about disclosure protecting investors by informing their trading decisions and their voting decisions. And disclosure protects the capital markets because it allows prices to incorporate that information and protect investors indirectly. Uh, but the SEC has pretty broad discretion within the scope of that mandate to require the disclosure of information. We'll uh, definitely get to that in a minute. I mean, one of the, I think, examples that a lot of people bring up uh, when, it, when it comes to that breadth of, of disclosure and, and what they can require, uh, they talk about the um, conflict minerals um, that was required. And of course that was arguably because of the mandate from Congress, but nonetheless, it, it kind of it broadened out what it required uh, regardless of the materiality standard, it just said you must disclose. And so we'll get to that in a second though. I don't wanna jump too, too far ahead. But one of the uh, issues that came up in that case and that I thought, thought was really interesting uh, was the discussion that I believe it was Chief Justice Marshall talked about in, that, in the opinion. And he talked about a concern for too much information. Uh, and I think, he, as he put it, he was concerned that uh, it was, would be an avalanche of trivia, in, trivial information that would not be conducive to informed decision making. Uh, so, Professor Fish, in the age of modern computers, artificial intelligence, how much information is too much? Uh, courts have implied a certain level of sophistication for a reason, quote, reasonable investor. So uh, would assuming the use of significant computing power be a bridge too far in uh, assessing the kind of overload of information that Justice Marshall talked about? So information overload is absolutely a problem. And former SEC Commissioner Troy Paredes wrote a very uh, frequently cited law review article in which he, you know, sort of explored that concern. But it's important to remember that not every investor is going to use all of the information that's disclosed directly, right? Our market today is filled with, you know, thousands of intermediaries who evaluate information, who process information, who disseminate that information to end users. So the Wall Street Journal might read thousands of proxy statements and do some sort of statistical analysis and a reporter writes an article and then I read that article and I use the information in that article for my trading decisions. I haven't done all of that legwork. I haven't used that computing power, but I still benefit from the disclosure. Well, that makes sense. And uh, Professor Rose, are, are there limit? And it sounds like Professor Fish, you were just kind of talking about some of this, which is, are there limits uh, to this argument that that, uh, that might be, it might be used too much to uh, prevent uh, the disclosure of, of certain amount of information or certain types of information? Yeah, so I mean, I think one function of the materiality doctrine is to prevent against this information overload concern. But I think how much of a concern that is really depends on what type of reasonable investor we're envisioning. If it's a hedge fund that uses AI to process SEC disclosures, or if it's the type of investor that doesn't directly read SEC filings, but uh, uh, instead defers to advice it gets from a sophisticated party, then I'm not too concerned about and shouldn't be too concerned about information overload. But if you're visualizing a you know, sophisticated uh, retail investor that wants to read a company's 10K in order to make a decision about what value to assign to its securities or how to vote on a slate of directors, then the information overload concern, I think, is, is a real one. It may, you know, the length of SEC filings may discourage individuals from even undertaking the task of a fund analysis, which may not be a bad thing, but, you know, I think in perspective, that's the information overload concern. I think the materiality doctrine helps to cabin a lot of other costs that are more significant than sort of the cost of information overload. And I think we'll get a chance to talk about some of those. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I did want to move on um, to another dis uh, a part of this discussion that I feel like as of late has come up uh, uh, quite a bit, and, th and that's his duty to disclose. Um, SEC Commissioner Allison Lee gave a speech back in May addressing, as she put it, the myths and misstatements about materiality. Uh, and I know, uh, Professor Fish, you just I, uh, mentioned one of them. Um, and she indicated in that discussion, or a, a large part of that discussion, dealt with the duty to disclose, and that her concerns were that companies uh, won't necessarily disclose certain material information unless a duty arises. So from the uh, relevant case law that I, I looked into, it appears that most of the cases uh, in this area of, of duty deal more to deal uh, do deal more uh, to uh, more to the fact of when certain information is disclosed as opposed to what information is disclosed. So, um, uh, Professor Fish, I was hoping that you could explain how this duty to disclose relates to the materiality standard and what information is ultimately disclosed to investors. Um, well, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> so basically what companies have to disclose for the most part is what the SEC tells them they have to disclose, right? The vast majority of disclosure obligations are the product of congressional legislation coupled with SEC rulemaking. Um, and as I said earlier, right, the SEC is not limited to requiring the disclosure of material information, at least material in the sense that was articulated in TSC against Northway. The SEC has the power to compel disclosure of information that's necessary or appropriate in the public interest or the, for the protection of investors. That's the legal standard, right? So, you know, we have areas, you know, that we can debate about whether the SEC should have required the disclosure or whether the disclosure is objectively material, whether it's something like conflict minerals, whether it's some of the current ESG issues, whether it's some, you know, a lot of the disclosures in connection with executive compensation, uh, perks, uh, you know, uh, relatively small dollar amounts of money. People can argue that those disclosures are not material, at least in the sort of fraud sense. But the SEC's mandate is broader than that. Um, what do people or what do companies have to disclose beyond what the SEC requires? Well, there are cases in which the courts have found a duty to disclose because a company makes half-truths. They say something, but they don't say the full story. They, uh, what they disclose is inherently misleading without telling investors more. And that's another important category. And there, finally, there are a series of situations in which the context creates a duty to disclosure. So for example, a corporate insider who is trading with a stockholder might have a duty to disclose based on state law fiduciary principles. Brokers have a lot of duties to disclose that are the product of SEC and FINRA rules. So um, relationships or situations can create additional disclosure obligations. Yeah, that makes sense. And that, and I probably didn't uh, state it as clearly as I could, but. Uh, a number of the cases that I read talked about when pieces of information had to be disclosed, because there is a requirement, a duty, if you will, to disclose certain uh, information annually or semi-annually with, with, via the 10K, the 8K, or, and some other, um, as you specifically mentioned, the SEC has required them to do that. And it seems like a lot of cases, to your point about um, statements that companies may have made, a duty that would not have required them to disclose certain information, in fact, comes to be because of things they say, they've, they've said or done or disclose, as you say, statements. Um, and I... that's, that's exactly right. And in fact, if you look at the cases, the vast majority of fraud cases involve not a company's failure to disclose, but a company lying, a company choosing to speak and then saying things that are not true. And that's where the materiality standard is most frequently articulated. And um, it's switching gears a little bit, though. But Professor Rose, uh, and we could talk. We're going to talk about this a little, a little bit more in a minute. But the SEC recently sent out a letter to companies uh, referencing this 2010 guidance on on climate change disclosure specifically. And the the question that a lot of people are having are uh, that that have asked or we've discussed is, could would it be helpful to have uh, a more clarifying statement from the SEC via guidance or even a particular rule that, that clarifies the other disclosure rules when it comes to climate and, and other, quote, ESG issues. 
as opposed to creating what they appear to be doing, which is a, a whole new framework for disclosure. Right. So, so just to kind of step back and provide some context. So in, in 2010, the SEC issued formal guidance, which highlighted existing mandatory uh, disclosure obligations that may call for the disclosure of uh, issues related to, to climate change. Um, and it, it laid out a series of items in Regulation SK that, that may that either explicitly call for information about the impact of environmental regulation on the company's business or uh, environmental litigation and, and then other more general sort of risk factor um, types of disclosures that may call for it. Um, and uh, a lot of people have complained that the um, disclosures that are being produced pursuant to those existing mandates are um, have, have been in, inadequate and that they're not producing the information that investors want or not producing it in the sort of um, consistent uh, and comparable way that would sort of facilitate the type of analysis that investors want, want to undertake. Um, if that's the case, the SEC has a broad range of potential options for sort of remedying the situation. The, the sort of letter that the staff put out um, uh, last month um, is one tool in the toolkit, sort of using the leverage that the staff has when it reviews um, SEC filings to push for more disclosure uh, or, or um, better formatted disclosure. It could issue revised formal guidance. Um, it could add um, instructions to existing uh, line items through uh, a rulemaking. It could add new line items, or it could, as your question um, highlighted, sort of adopt an existing sort of holistic uh, climate-related disclosure regime that has been um, already created by private standard setters like the um, Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. I don't have an opinion as to which of those techniques, if any, is the right um, approach here. But what I would emphasize is that I think that in evaluating calls for enhanced climate related disclosure, that the SEC ought to approach those um, uh, calls sort of in the traditional way that it's always approached mandatory disclosure questions, which is you know, identifying what information is not being produced uh, are not being produced well that financially motivated investors want um, and, um, and considering whether the uh, importance of that information to financially motivated investors outweighs the cost of, of requiring that disclosure. And so, um, so that's what I would say. Yeah, and this, uh, Professor, this goes a little bit back to Professor Fish, what, what you had mentioned about um, the information that's disclosed by companies in the sense that yes, companies disclose certain pieces of information because they are required to by the SEC or other regulatory framework. But as we've seen in the last few years, at least with regard to climate and, and some other issues, shareholder proposals at, at annual meetings are certainly uh, now being a pass. They, they are in fact passed uh, at a rate that they hadn't in the, in the you know, not too distant future. And so companies are in fact having to produce information and disclose certain information to their investors uh, through that means as well. In addition, of course, to the kind of the public pressure that, that companies, all companies have to deal with all the time. So I feel like that there, there are more ways for companies to disclose. I guess the question is whether it is, is mandated uh, or not. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, I mean, shareholder proposals don't create a legal obligation. It, they neither make information material or require the company to respond and to provide the disclosure. Of course, you know, it is common, especially today, if you have a lot of large institutional investors who say, we want this information, it's common for companies to provide that information. But the what you're referring to, the frequency of these shareholder proposals, I think is one of the reasons why the SEC is moving toward increasing the disclosure standards so that we have number one some uniformity number two some predictability it's not really clear that the scattershot approach that we see through shareholder proposals is the best way to um, standardize disclosure in this area right yeah and, and, and to that um and i know that you, you all have seen this uh, the, the data on this which is that over 90 percent of s p companies now publish just what are called sustainability uh reports uh, and this has been from a, a either shareholder proposal 
or market-based influence or just companies evaluating internally that this is something they need to do. Or as I always I love to bring uh, BlackRock CEO Larry Fink into my, my discussions uh, or his annual letter that, that, that asks for companies to, um, uh, to provide these. So I guess the question is, Professor Rose, does the current regulatory framework and best practices provide investors with enough information um, I, I know that Professor Fish just mentioned the, the consistency um, and comparability as being the ra a rationale for expanding the disclosure uh, framework, but are, are investors not getting enough information? Well, so that's a, that's a difficult question to answer. You know, the SEC's uh, disclosure regime is always a work in progress. There are likely mandated disclosure items that are not useful to investors that ought to be eliminated, and there's likely uh, material information that investors would like um, that currently isn't mandated or isn't mandated in, in a form that is useful enough uh, for analysis. And I think the SEC should always be on the, the lookout uh, for those sorts of items and, and to determine, you know, on an individual basis whether uh, reform is needed. Um, you know, with respect to information that is not currently mandated, but that investors want, um, you know, investors have a lot of different motivation. There may be financially material information that's not being disclosed that's related to environmental issues or other issues that fall under the ESG umbrella um, that is not currently mandated. Uh, there may be other information that investors may want access to for other reasons, for sociopolitical reasons. Um, with respect to all of that information, they do have other tools available to them. Rule 14A8 is one and, and sort of, um, informal pressure is another, and I think that's been the most useful in terms of uh, promoting uniformity and standardization. Uh, you know, BlackRock and the other large asset managers have um, succeeded in pushing companies towards certain disclosure frameworks, so I think there is increased use of uh, similar um, frameworks. Um, and so there has been progress on that front with respect to comparability and standardization. Um, However, it could it, maybe it's not enough. And another key thing with sort of um, those disclosures being produced through these mechanisms of private ordering versus through SEC mandate is obviously SEC disclosures, disclosures that are contained in SEC filings are subject to uh, much uh, higher liability than voluntary disclosures through sustainability reports. Um, and so I think that's um, uh, one big difference uh, that some may view as a, as a problem, others may not. Um, you know, to move from that conclusion to sort of advocacy for wholesale adoption of one of these private frameworks, I think is a difficult leap to make just because again, this is a broad set of issues. Not all of them are um, financially material. And, um, and, and I think that that really is something that needs to be considered on a item by item basis. Yeah, also, Professor. I just want to push back a little bit on um, uh, Professor Fish's characterization of the SEC's the scope of the SEC's authority. So while there's not you know anything that says you can't you have to conduct a TSC style materiality analysis before you mandate disclosure, I don't think that uh, that uh, Professor Fish would agree that the SEC can mandate disclosure on any item based on sort of any facet of what counts as the public interest. I mean, the SEC is a capital markets regulator. And it has always perceived that its disclosure mandate should be related to information that's financially material. It's taken that position over time. Conflicts Mineral is a counterpoint to that. And the SEC has always said, unless there's a congressional mandate requiring us to, to move outside of that frame of thinking, that it's outside of at least our prudential uh, authority. Um, and so I just, that's sort of unrelated to my most recent, well, it is related to what I, my more recent comments, but I wanted to, to put that on the table as well. Yeah, and that had definitely comes up every time it seems like the discussion goes to what the SEC uh, should be mandating or not, that that it, the conflict minerals comes up because I think, I think most would, if they're being honest with themselves, and I think they even came out and said it when they did it, that this is not a material, this is not an issue of materiality. This is an issue of you must disclose kind of kind of end of story. Uh, there, there weren't any kind of parameters on, uh, on that. And so I think that there's some concern that the SEC might be heading in that direction with ESG related disclosures. And unlike the conflict mil uh, uh, minerals um, mandate from Congress, there's many that argue that the SEC does not have the mandate to do 
that which they appear to be heading towards with ESG disclosure. Uh, Professor Fish, what are your thoughts on that? Do I have that wrong? Am I oversimplifying it? If I can just focus that a little bit more, um, because I think the real concern about the conflicts mineral disclosure was that nobody thought it was about protecting investors, right? It was about protecting somebody else. And that's completely consistent with what Amanda just said, right? The SEC's mandate is to protect investors in the markets. And so, no, they can't require disclosure of any old thing at all. And um, they also have to, you know, consider efficiency and the impact on capital formation and cost benefit analysis. And so there are a lot of disclosures that, you know, you can come up with some theory on which it protects investors, but the game isn't worth the candle. And the SEC shouldn't require disclosures there either. There are clearly limiting principles and important limiting principles. And I think they came to bear in the conflict mineral situation. But you're right, that's kind of a special case in part because there was explicit legislation. And while we can argue that this is perhaps something that Congress shouldn't have compelled the SEC to do, and if people at the SEC said, right, this isn't in our wheelhouse, right? That's a, that's a separate issue from when the SEC is exercising its own judgment and trying to act within the scope of its general uh, regulatory authority. Um, but you started off, if I can take us back, with a question about um, uh, sustainability reports and voluntary disclosure, and why isn't that enough? And I do have a couple of thoughts on that. And I think one indication that it's not enough is that investors say they're not getting the information they need. Uh, you referenced shareholder proposals. If investors were happy with what was in sustainability reports, we wouldn't see both this proliferation of shareholder proposals and, oh, by the way, they're not just special interest shareholder proposals. They are commanding a majority of the votes that are cast in support. So that is one indication that maybe something's wrong. Another indication, investors, big investors, small investors say there are critical issues on which companies are not reporting right? Voluntary disclosure is voluntary. There's a tendency to cherry pick. You put in your sustainability report all the pictures of your workers, you know, washing the oil off of bunnies, but you don't put the pictures of your, uh, you know, factories emitting smoke into the environment. You just kind of leave off the table. And that tendency to engage in cherry picking, perfectly rational, that was what motivated mandatory disclosure to begin with. The idea that companies had an incentive to disclose good news, but bad news and bad companies provided substantially less information. If that information is important to investors, um, investors should get it. And the third thing is sustainability reports. Amanda said, well, companies face less uh, uh, exposure, less, less liability. I'm not 100% sure that that's true. Any public disclosure is subject to at least the general anti-fraud provision. If a company lies in its sustainability report, it's subject to 10b-5 liability. And we're starting to see, as companies make more voluntary disclosure, investors are starting to pick up on this. Now, by and large, if you disclose true information that's just not the whole picture, those cases of fraud are going to be hard to bring. But we're starting to see cases, company says it's committed to diversity in its sustainability report, and you look at the statistics and you don't see any evidence of that, first shareholder suits are starting to come down the pipe. Well, I just, uh, that, on, on that note, on the voluntary disclosure side of it, I did want to remind those who are watching, again, on YouTube, Facebook, uh, or following us on Twitter, please submit your questions online in the chat function or at hashtag BPC um, live. So um, one thing that has started to, uh, to really, to that point that we were just talking about, <clears throat> when you're talking about disclosure, especially uh, when it comes to that which is disclosed in your sustainability report, uh, but the, also under the current, um, the, the current requirements deal with future, uh, future events. Um, and I know recently uh, an FSOC, and for those that haven't been following it, probably like the rest of us, FSOC is the Financial Stability Oversight Council. It was created under Dodd-Frank in 2010. Essentially, think of it as the, uh, a, a council of all the federal regulatory agencies. 
um, got together. They came up with this, uh, got with this report. Uh, probably the main thing of the report was that they found that climate change was a, a, a systemic risk to the economy. Probably, you know, that, that's the front line. But in it, they talked about this scenario analysis or, or helping companies having to predict out certain, certain factors. Um, traditionally, uh, companies have, have dealt with these in what are called forward-looking statements. They essentially say, hey, this is what we believe based on the facts we have now. Uh, and that they're, they're given some kind of protection. Uh, they're given some kind of protection to that. But this letter that we referenced earlier that the SEC, the sample letter that they, uh, that they sent out to companies, lists specific examples of climate-related events that may need to be discussed or disclosed, uh, be it physical risks, pending legislation, regulatory action, business trends, et cetera. While foreseeable risks, that we, as we talked about, are protected under this forward-looking statement, line item disclosures about uncertain future effects could prove more difficult and could impose significant liability to Professor Rose's point before. So if we could start there, I wanted to ask Professor Rose, how can how can the SEC balance this out, this these scenario analysis out, um, looking out 20, 30, 40, 50 years with the with the real world practical and legal implications of including or determining uh, what that scenario's effect might be or whether it's material? Sorry, that was a lot lot coming out there. Yeah, there's a lot there's a lot to unpack there. Let me just uh, take a step back and explain that you know under. Supreme Court doctrine, whether some uncertain future event is considered material uh, within the traditional notion of that term, uh, requires that the company balance the probability that the event will occur against the magnitude of uh, the event to the firm and the event that it did occur. And this, the seminal case involved preliminary merger negotiations. And so in that context, you have to say, well, how likely is it that the merger will be closed and how impactful will it be on the company? And that sort of inquiry is not um, easy, but it, you know, the company is weighing facts that are in its possession. When we move to something like scenario analysis of uncertain future weather events that may have unknown sort of geographic landing points. Um, that, that strikes me as a very different endeavor. Um, you know, the, the particular impact of um, these events on particular firms, I think, is difficult to predict. And I, I don't think that for most companies, it would be material in the traditional sense of the term. But I don't think that's what the point of scenario analysis is, from what I understand. Um, having uh, read a, a little bit about it, it seems that it's more of a management technique to get companies to think about, um, you know, sort of all future plausible scenarios and to sort of engage them in, um, in thinking through those risks. So it's more of a management technique, which it's a little bit odd for sort of SEC disclosures. It's not unheard of, but it's not sort of within the traditional lane to be using SEC disclosures to really prod management to engage in certain types of uh, evaluations for other purposes. So, um, so I think it's something um, different. I have no idea what type of resources companies would have to um, devote to that type of analysis, particularly um, if uh, those analyses had to be disclosed in SEC filings. And that brings it back to the topic of um, liability that you raised in your question. So. The safe harbor for forward-looking statements that is contained in, in legislation provides companies a, a layer of protection when they make predictions about the future. Um, and it's a pretty robust protection. It's not complete. There are ways that plaintiffs can um, uh, plead cases that suggest that either the cautionary language, which is a um, one way to invoke the safe harbor, isn't robust enough because there are present facts that weren't disclosed or there was an omission of uh, present fact necessary to put the statement in context. So the safe harbor, you know, can still give rise to, to litigation. Um, if the SEC went forward and mandated scenario analysis, um, I don't think there's any reason why that analysis wouldn't also be subject to the protection of the safe harbor. Um, but it would be a great expansion of liability risk because I think it would be the furthest the SEC has ever gone in mandating forward-looking disclosures. There are, um, you know, in the MDNA of a 10K, a company has to talk about known risk factors and, and so forth, but this is a much bigger endeavor. So I think if the SEC did that, it would need to think about how it might sort of shore up liability protection, whether 
um, through, you know, declaring the analysis to be immaterial as a matter of law or doing as it's done in other contexts, which is sort of identifying under what conditions the cautionary language will be deemed um, adequate. So when it's imposed new sort of forward looking or soft information disclosure obligations on companies in the past, it's sometimes done that or broadened the safe harbor. It has the authority to broaden uh, the safe harbor. And so, so I think that would definitely be something that should be on the table were scenario analysis to become something that was mandated. And Professor Fish, I know that you mentioned a cost benefit analysis before, and it, it certainly sounds like what what Professor Rose just talked about would add significant costs for companies to, to engage in these kind of broader long-term uh, statements. And, and the same argument I've heard being made that, that the same type of analysis makes it very difficult in some people's minds to justify a very expansive mandatory disclosure uh, framework that the SEC is currently talking about. How do you think that that balances out? I mean, are, are the benefits, climate change obviously is an incredibly important issue. Um, does it in and of itself balance that cost out for, for, for both the people and, and I suppose globally speaking? So with respect to the specific question of scenario analysis, um, to me, I mean, FSOC is, in my mind, largely a banking regulator. Scenario analysis sounds like stress tests. Um, we've seen, you know, stress tests evolve with some difficulty in the banking sector. Banking regulation and the goals of banking regulation are quite different from capital markets regulation, and I don't think it's a natural fit. I also think um, Amanda has raised a number of really good points about the competence of companies to do this in any way that's going to be decision useful for investors, right? You're largely talking about companies trying to make predictions based on information that's not in their skill set um, uh, with sort of very uncertain long-term assumptions, that's pretty hard. And if that's hard, right, the quality of the resulting disclosure is questionable. Uh, in terms of liability, um, Amanda's absolutely right. We have existing safe harbors, and if they're not good enough, the SEC could easily tweak the safe harbors. If the SEC decided this was useful information, I don't think liability risk would be a big obstacle. The final point I want to make is Amanda said something about this being an area in which the disclosure requirements seem to be pushing management decision making. These are things that management should consider. And I guess this is some place where I would differ just a little bit with Amanda. I kind of think that's the goal of securities disclosure or one of the goals of securities disclosure more broadly. I mean, any number of people have said you manage what you measure. The process of gathering and analyzing and reporting on what a company is doing has an odd way of focusing the mind focusing the mind of management that's responsible for, for preparing the disclosures and the directors that are overseeing that process. And that's one of the, I think, values, not just of um, securities disclosure generally, but of broadening the scope of disclosure today in response to new developments, new challenges, new problems. Wonderful, Th thank you. Um... I want to switch gears just a little bit here um, and talk about something that has been a lot of chatter here in, in Washington as of late and maybe up in Wall Street too, but definitely down here. But it's about, and we've heard Chairman Gensler and, and from the SEC and others talk about that, which is that the SEC imposing uh, uh, regulatory requirements on privately held companies. So uh, the SEC, obviously those that are listening, uh, is, is regulates the, the public market, the, the publicly traded companies. But there's a push, it, it appears, uh, and, and not just behind the scenes, but publicly stated that they are looking to try to hold private companies accountable. I guess the first question is, uh, does the SEC have the authority to do this? And either one of you can, <laughs> if you, uh, okay. Professor Rose, I, we, can, we can start with you. Um, just, it's, it's an interesting topic that it keeps popping up in here, here in DC. It is interesting. Um, you know, the, the authority that the SEC invokes to require, you know, the filing of registration statements and annual reports and periodic reports, 
um, it, it does not extend to private companies. Sort of the, the trigger is reporting company status, whether there's some other source of authority that could be found somewhere in the securities laws to, to mandate this type of disclosure is not something that I've investigated. I would say sort of at a broad um, conceptual level, this, the logic of the SEC's mandatory disclosure regime and the sort of public-private divide is that with respect to private companies, um, by and large, the investors who can invest in those companies are those who can, the law assumes, can fend for themselves and, and um, demand the information that they want without the need of a, a federal agency to mandate it. So um, when we talk about imposing sort of broad disclosure obligations on private companies, I think you can think of it in one of two ways. One is that, oh, well, it's highlighting that really this information isn't about what investors need because we assume that investors can get what they want. And this is really about um, other stakeholders and more uh, sort of social political uh, concerns, which uh, we, we can talk about, but I think raises a whole host of concerns about the SEC's uh, authority and democratic accountability and institutional competence, particularly when, as, as Jill was talking about, these are efforts to, to not just mandate disclosure, but to affect behavior. Um, the other possibility is that something's wacky with the public-private divide, that with the rise of unicorns, that mandatory, that sort of we ought to maybe reconsider the triggers for reporting company status, which is a, you know, a different way to, to think about it. But I think um, it, it raises some sort of fundamental questions down one of those two lanes. Amanda's totally right. There is something wacky with the public-private divide. Um, a lot of that wackiness is the result of deliberate decisions by both Congress and the SEC. Right? They've made it easier to raise money in the private markets, um, and uh, so companies have taken the bait. Um, but keep in mind, number one, the SEC does regulate and does protect investors in those private markets. The SEC has a host of tools that provide how you go about raising money, even when you don't use the public markets. In some cases, the SEC requires certain disclosures, audited financial statements in the private markets, right? So this is not something outside the scope of the SEC's turf. And Amanda's right. Um, private company investors are assumed to be able to fend for themselves. But when we talk about the capital markets, there isn't that clear delineation between the public and private markets, right? Capital markets, there's a lot of spillover. There's a lot of impact um, in one market that affects the other. And so I think the SEC has some room within its regulatory authority to at least make an adjustment. Now, whether the SEC will do that, I'm skeptical. I mean, you know, you all are in Washington, right? You have a much better sense of, you know, the political climate than I do. But I'm looking as recently as November of 2020, the SEC amended its rules to make it even easier to raise money in the private markets without regulation. And so the idea that the SEC would turn around and everyone's saying, gee, climate disclosure, ESG, ESG disclosure, that's much more burdensome, that's much more complicated than traditional financial disclosure. So the idea the SEC would all of a sudden say, okay, these private companies now have to enter into this new disclosure space, even though we didn't think um, they needed to disclose basic financial information, that strikes me as a very abrupt, abrupt shift in direction. So while they might be talking about it, you think, and you say have some basis for doing it, you think it might be a bridge too far, at least currently? Well, I mean, we also know that in recent years, the SEC has taken the view that it should start from the top down, that if it's going to apply new disclosure requirements, those should go to the biggest companies, the companies that are experienced with disclosure, the companies that have disclosure teams on staff, and so forth. So I don't see why climate would be any different. Yeah, and I think that the House Financial Services passed this omnibus bill this past summer dealing with all kinds of 11 titles or something in it. And uh, they all dealt with a disclosure. And in the last section of that, they dealt with the distinction between large and small and say, whatever we are mandating or wh whatever this legislation might look like, theoretically, uh, we would ask the, the SEC to make the distinction between the large companies, to your point, uh, Professor Fish, that it sounds like that they would start with the large company and, and kind of see how it works almost, and, and then push it down for those small uh, business owners that are watching. Um, I did want to, there's a couple other issues that 
I know have have come up a few times at our other discussions. Um, and one is this term called double materiality. Um, the idea of disclosing a material information, financially material information we've just been talking about right now. But this idea of double materiality, it, it, it seems to then look at not what is how a, uh, what is affecting a company, but what, how a company affects the human environment or the broader um, in, environment. And so, Professor Fish, I don't know if, if you have thoughts on, on double materiality and its use. It certainly is is making some head headway uh, in the EU, and there are um, you know from uh, uh, SEC Commissioner Lee and others have certainly brought it up here in discussions. Is double materiality or something like it? Is that in our future? Um, well, people use the term double materiality in a couple of different ways. One, as you said, is about the company's impact on the world. And to my mind, that sounds a little bit like what Amanda was talking about a few minutes ago, right? You know, with scenario analysis. How do I assess my impact, right? If I, um, if everyone in my company recycles all of their paper. What impact is that going to have on deforestation? Is a company really in a position to do that? So, you know, some of that is pretty hard. The other way in which double materiality is used is to try to distinguish um, economically or financially material information from information that people may concede is material, but it's in some social or ESG kind of sense. And there, I have a lot of trouble with the term because it's not clear to me that it's a binary. I think a lot of investors are seeking environmental disclosure because that they think it affects a company's uh, risk vulnerability, that it affects a company's uh, susceptibility to regulation, that it's going to have an impact uh, on the bottom line in the short term or in the long term. I mean, a, 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 if a, um, a court, if a Dutch court can order an oil company to cut its emissions, um, then presumably the company's environmental behavior has an economic impact on its, you know, on its financial performance. So, you know, yes, we hear a lot about that term. And I think a lot of people use that term to try and bring additional information and make the argument, yes, it fits within materiality. If materiality, going back to our first question, if that was your limiting principle, here's a way to get a more expansive view of what materiality is. Right, and Professor Rose, I know that um, the, you, you we mentioned um, earlier TCFD. I don't know if we've mentioned it, but we certainly have talked about it. SASB, uh, which um, both of which I know that Chairman Gensler is co contemplating, considering in these these new rules uh, that that go up. But um, they and other um, disclosure frameworks and standard setters from um, GRI and, and others have come up with this term that they call nested materiality, which seems to be like nested as in, we have the financially material, and then just to step out is, is what we just talked about and in, in, in maybe a, a broader sense. And, and it, it seems to be a growing concept. Uh, and, and I don't wanna, I don't mean to confuse it with what people refer to as dynamic materiality, just changing materiality, but it seems like people are changing to Professor Fish's point, changing the definition of materiality to get the information that they want out of companies. How, how, in a practical sense, from a cost per perspective for a company, how does that work? At, at what point does that become too burdensome? Well, I mean, we can make up a bunch of new words. I mean, I think the concepts are still pretty basic and we should be distracted by that. I mean, there's information that's financially material in the traditional sense. Um, and some ESG information um, may fit within that definition. We can't talk about it in the abstract. It's completely, you know, there's no traction there because we're talking about an umbrella set of very disparate different topics. So, you know, certain ESG topics may uh, be uh, financially material to particular firms and particular industries and others um, may be of interest to investors because investors are human beings that care about all sorts of things beyond the bottom line. And, um, and so I think the distinction is between sort of socially and politically stake, what I'll call stakeholder oriented disclosures, things that are important to, to stakeholders, which include investors that are not prioritizing financial returns, and then those that are material in, in the traditional sense. And um, I think that, you know, I, I um, 
am not supportive of expanding the SEC's disclosure mandates to stakeholder oriented um, uh, audiences. Um, uh, and I think it does carry a, a lot of costs. Um, you know, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, as we've already discussed, like everything that's material in the traditional sense isn't subject uh, to a disclosure mandate. Like the SEC, even with respect to financially material information, has to engage in a cost benefit analysis. How important is this material information to investors? And how does that weigh against the costs of requiring its production, costs that ultimately investors are going to bear as well? How does it affect capital formation and the like? That is a difficult um, calculus, and people may disagree with how the SEC handles it, um, even with respect to traditionally financially material information. Um, but it's one that the SEC has competence to conduct. When we start thinking about socially oriented disclosure, how does the SEC engage in that cost benefit calculation? It has to weigh how socially important is this information versus what are the costs to capital formation and to, to companies and investors? That's an inherently political question in my view. And I don't think that the SEC has the democratic accountability to be making those calls. Or the competence. I agree with everything Amanda said. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so uh, the competence actually is uh, is a topic that's also come up. Some of the the critics of this kind of expansive, uh, mandatory, prescriptive uh, disclosure framework uh, that the SEC is talking about. Some of the critics are saying you SEC don't have the competence to do the, to do that. You just you don't have the manpower, um, uh, woman power. You you, don't, you just don't have the resources. Um, I say that because that, that's the argument, but I also know uh, that Chairman Gensler is asking for more money. Um, and, and I know, uh, Professor Fish, you, you mentioned that, that FSOC's more on the banking side of it, but the SEC, of course, is part of that. And they have essentially said in their most recent report that as the Biden administration has done, that this should be at least regarded with climate. So let's, sorry, sorry, probably should have prefaced that, that they should have a whole of government approach. So even though the SEC might not have individually the the technical capability of handling um, both the types of information that are coming or the volume of information coming is there not an argument to be made that with a whole of government approach they could they could figure it out or not am i off base there so but you've pivoted a little bit because a lot of the concerns that amanda expressed about cost and competence related to stakeholder oriented information and i think there is a pretty compelling argument that at least some environmental and climate information is clearly material from a traditional economic financial perspective. Uh, yet the SEC hasn't fully rationalized even that core set of disclosure principles. So, you know, one can make a start without having to face a lot of those difficult questions. Uh, the broader question is, well, you know, can the SEC leverage its limited expertise when it is trying to require disclosure in new areas? And the answer is, of course it can, right? I mean, the SEC has historically been very slow to embrace technology. It has an increasing staff of fantastic economists. Um, it could make better use of data collection and data analysis, and that could inform its rulemaking. The SEC could use and reach out to other agencies, right? The EPA could help the SEC in terms of climate disclosure. And the SEC could reach out to some of the private standard setters that are in existence. Um, Amanda, I think, earlier referred to you know, delegations, but the SEC doesn't have to go that far. There are a lot of people who have studied this area. There are a lot of standard setters out there. There's nothing that would prohibit the SEC from getting up to speed by looking what, what, at what other organizations have done. But doesn't that, to Professor Rose's point, doesn't that start to push the SEC then out of their traditional role and become more of a, a public policy, uh, um, broader policy, gov broader government policy entity than as opposed to that strictly independent agency strictly focused on the on the capital markets or? Well, but that's the limiting principle, strictly focused on investors and the capital markets. Yes, the SEC continually has to move out of its comfort zone. When the SEC thinks about requiring disclosures with respect to cybersecurity, right? Cybersecurity comes in, it's a new issue. The SEC has to get up to speed, but that doesn't mean that cybersecurity isn't important, economically important to issuers and to investors. 
Okay, I want to switch gears a little bit, but it, in some way it, it, it um, is with what we were talking about in, in that um, differentiation between companies, because we're sometimes when we talk about materiality and these issues, we think about just one company, one sector, and how it applies. But of course, these types of rules that the SEC are, are working on are going to apply across uh, uh, multiple sectors, and even within sectors, vastly different companies. So uh, the question, uh, you know, different companies and industries face different risks, of course, and opportunities related to climate change. And they do, uh, as we know, have different metrics um, that would be material to their investors. So Professor Rose, I'll start with you. Um, can the SEC allow for a comply or explain mechanism? As mentioned, of course, in, in Commissioner Lee's March uh, request for information, that would allow companies to opt out of disclosure obligations that would not be material? Or can the SEC allow for industry-based materiality screens? So I think it's, it's, it's really about the, the, can they, does it make more sense to have a co comply or explain as opposed to a strict, rigid, prescriptive response? So, um, so you know, the complier explain idea for ESG disclosure that's that's referenced in the release is finds its origins in a 2017 law review article by Professor Virginia Harper Ho. And you know, complier explain is a concept that's relevant in the UK for corporate governance matters. You know, comply with this corporate governance. Um, um, uh, you know, this is how you should organize your board, uh, no classified boards, or explain why you're deviating from this preferred best practice. Um, the SEC has, has experimented with a, a little bit, you know, when um, Sarbanes-Oxley required, um, requires companies to either adopt a code of ethics or explain why they haven't. It's, it's like the UK, you know, and it, um, um, part of an effort to sort of nudge companies without mandating certain practices. It would work a little bit differently in the context of disclosure, I guess, essentially, it would be, as you suggested, you know, um, disclose information on this particular ESG topic or explain why you don't think the information is material. Um, so it would still require quite a bit of new disclosure. And I think that the liability risk that I think Jill is overly downplaying um, would be significant. Um, if that were the, the model that was adopted, I'd also be left wondering, well, why should companies have to explain why they think certain ESG things are immaterial, whereas they don't have to with respect to traditional uh, disclosures. There are a variety of line item disclosures that have a materiality qualifier. And if they're not material, the companies just don't include the information. They don't you know, provide some narrative explanation as to why it's immaterial. So it's sort of privilege ESG in a certain way. So I think it's, it's somewhat odd and, and doesn't really address the, the cost concern. As for industry specific disclosures, I think that makes trem a tremendous amount of sense. I think it's clear that um, certain um, uh, information related to climate change, for example, is going to be more important to the oil and gas industry than it is to certain other industries. And that it would make a lot of sense for uh, line item disclosures to uh, be applicable only to companies in particular industries. And so that strikes me as, a, as an effective way to um, move in this direction without imposing unnecessary costs um, on, on companies where it may not be relevant to their investors. I don't know, uh, Professor Fish, if you wanted to, to jump in there. Uh, I, I know that uh, we some of these arguments were, were kind of circling around and talking about. But Yeah, no, I mean, I agree. I mean, I think what Amanda has said is, you know, there's a lot of room for the sort of sensitivity, both to industry and issuer specific uh, differences in existing disclosure requirements. There are materiality qualifiers. There are financial standards that don't require you to report something that isn't relevant to your business. There's no reason why those same principles wouldn't carry over to uh, environmental or other what we call ESG disclosures, right? There's no reason we would we would change course there. Minutes left. And I did want to ask about uh, a topic that's come up um, a number of times, uh, and that is this, this, the difference between prescriptive-based disclosure and principles-based disclosure. Um, was hoping, uh, Professor Fitch, if you could, from a prescriptive perspective, what is the, the SEC keeps talking about that, uh, a mandating a prescriptive disclosure model. What does that mean for those that are watching? Oh, I think you're on mute. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think the idea, and this goes back to what Amanda was talking about earlier, right? Um, the <coughs> principles-based approach allows a fair amount of company-specific tailoring. Whereas if the uh, SEC says you have to disclose how many gallons of water you use, right, that's going to be a requirement that applies across the board. And so even companies that don't have significant water usage are going to have to gather that information and to provide it. Um, the advantage of a prescriptive approach is comparisons are easier, verification is easier, we have a sense of what the information means. And so it, all of our existing disclosures strike a balance between the prescriptive and the principles-based approaches, and that seems to make sense. But uh, Professor Rose, on the principle side of this, this argument, there's as, as Professor Fish just mentioned, there's certainly going to be additional costs. Uh, or could be additional costs if they if the SEC goes forward with a prescriptive as opposed to a principles based. I was wondering if you could address that or the benefits, if you could, of the principles approach. Yeah, I mean there are there are trade obvious and well known trade offs between the two approaches. The benefits of the principle based approach is uh, flexibility. You don't have companies that may be forced to disclose information that over time becomes irrelevant or outdated. You allow companies to tailor the disclosures to what is really going to be important to their investors. Um, you uh, you allow flexibility and 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 all of that. Whereas you trade off the consistency and comparability and potential um, um, uh, greater um, uh, inclusiveness of prescriptive uh, requirements. So prescriptive requirements are probably um, more costly, um, at least in the you know sense of what companies have to do. But there are these other costs um, of a principles-based approach, and people have different intuitions about which is the better approach. And it depends on the nature of the information that you're seeking to disclose. Again, it's hard to talk about these things in the abstract, you know, with respect to, this was a big topic when the SEC recently updated Regulation SK and updated its human capital management disclosures. There were calls for really prescriptive data about workforce um, um, protocols and the like. And the SEC determined that a principles-based approach um, was a, a better approach and they had there was a reasoned analysis people disagreed and now there's an effort to sort of redo that and have more prescriptive items and that's just going to be a, a contested um, uh, issue that depends yep. on one's priors. Chairman Gensler has said just uh, just that, <laughs> that 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 will in fact be something uh, that they will be looking into doing so. Um, I wanted to thank you both, Professor Rose, Professor Fish, for taking this time this afternoon. Uh, your your in, your insight to these uh, from both not only the uh, legal side of it, but also from even the, the political and policy side of it, have, have, is just amazing. I hope we can get you uh, both to come back at some point in the future as we here uh, at BPC continue to talk about ESG and this disclosure. Um, framework that the, the SEC is working on. So wanted to thank you both again. And for those watching, please uh, stay tuned. We will uh, indicate the next in this series of ESG events. Um, please uh, stay tuned and you will hear something shortly. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Tim. Thank you.